Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward. And what better place than here in the crossroads at the Mid-America Arts Alliance to help us launch a new series called Arts Upload. We'll start with a birthday bash for Charlie Parker and a poem for ball players from days gone by. Also show you how something called Bread KC helps funnel funds to deserving artists and their projects. All that and more ahead on the upload. Maris, you're from Manila. Mm -hmm. now, does much jazz get played in the Philippines? No, not much. You know, there's some jazz bars here and there, but it's not like here. Yeah, but there are <laughs> places around the world where it's still a very big deal, and American jazz artists are held in the highest esteem, maybe none more so than Charlie Parker. The bird, as he was known, died in New York, but he's buried here. In August, a new group called Jazz Alive decided that more people should be celebrating the musical legacy he left behind. Yeah, that led to 17 days of music and events, many of which producer and videographer John McGrath attended, so you could see more of the ways that Bird still lives. There's music before Charlie Parker, and there's music after Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker changed the whole way the jazz is played. Bird is super important to me. <laughs> when you go to Europe and you know you say Charlie Parker, they say Kansas City. Charlie Parker was born in Kansas City in 1920. He grew up surrounded by music in what could rightly be called the nation's jazz capital at the time. A place where bands led by the likes of Benny Moten and Count Basie often kept dancers up all night. I remember um, Claude Fiddler Williams saying to me once that, you know, in Kansas City, you know, this is where you got your jazz license. If you really wanted to play, you had to play well in Kansas City and then you could play anywhere in the world. The young alto saxophonist honed his craft in bands like Jay McShann's, but soon headed off to New York City, where he and Dizzy Gillespie, among others, cooked up a whole new brand of jazz, one that emphasized solos and wild improvisation. A bebop is like the antithesis of the swing era. It's a small group. They go in and out of key. It's played fast. One musician talked about it, it's like, hanging on to a fire truck by your fingertips when you played with Charlie Parker. When you study his music and you get inside the chord progressions and you get inside the melodies, you realize then also how brilliant he was as a musician. All whilst he had so many challenges in an environment that he grew up in that, that would make one think, how can you be so brilliant when you had all these things working against you? The twin demons of alcohol and drug abuse cut Charlie Parker's life tragically short. Despite his worldwide fame, here in his hometown, the sculpture near 18th and Vine is one of the few tangible ways he's remembered today. Not good enough, says a new group calling itself Jazz Alive. We want to thank everybody for coming and welcome to this kickoff celebration to Charlie Parker. In an unprecedented show of unity, the Jazz Ambassadors, the Elder Statesmen of Jazz, the UMKC Conservatory of Music, the Mutual Musicians Foundation, and the American Jazz Museum came together to create a 17-day celebration of what would have been Bird's 94th birthday, complete with tours of local landmarks and panel discussions. He began his career in 1935, right across the street at the Lincoln, Lincoln Building, at the Lincoln Hall, playing with a group called the 12 chords of rhythm. And naturally, music, lots of music, much of it performed by local players at jazz venues all over town. Did we mention puppets? They had those too. 
and of course, plenty of the poultry which spawned his distinctive nickname. Anytime you do a Charlie Parker reception, you have to include chicken. Hey, you want to see a before and after? Regardless of how it came about, the fact that the jazz community, when we hear the name Bird, we automatically identify that with one of the most significant jazz icons. And I think it's kind of fitting, you know, because the bird is always flying, always soaring, always seeking information, and always looking, you know, to survive, if you will. And that kind of typifies his life. One of the highlights of those two and a half weeks was saxman Bobby Watson holding court in the Blue Room. Bobby brought in an old friend from Washington, D.C. for the occasion. Singer George Johnson, Jr. says it was an honor to help pay tribute. Charlie Parker would go down as one of the greatest musicians ever. Anybody who's playing music is playing some type of lick that Charlie Parker created. Another special guest that night, Kim Parker, Charlie's adopted daughter, was overwhelmed by the city's reception. I mean, Bird has left his stamp on this town for good reason. So the legacy of his music is incalculable. It's so enormous that you can't even really wrap your head around it. Downtown at the Majestic, young trumpeter Herman Mahari proved that the torch has been ably passed to a new generation. Bird is an important part of Kansas City heritage. It's, it seems like we're finally honing on that, and this could become an, a, an, an international thing, you know? People from all over could come to celebrate Charlie Parker here in Kansas City, which, where this, which is where they should celebrate him. Parker's music is still being played in clubs around the world, but there's only one place that this happens. Lincoln Cemetery on Kansas City's east side is where the bird was laid to rest after his body gave out at the age of only 34. It's a very peaceful place. It's a very beautiful place. And it's become a pilgrimage to go there. Uh, you know, you go there and there'll be a wine bottle sitting there, somebody paying tribute or read. People leave, leave things for him. We were framing up sort of the 17 days of celebrating Charlie Parker, and I love that phrase. Rather than a festival, it's celebration. Um, we felt one of the things we needed to celebrate was him at his gravesite. Uh, and so we're very happy that we were able to do that and look forward to making that a, an ongoing component of the uh, 17th day or whatever number of days it is in the future celebration. You know, the spoken word is a bigger part of Kansas City's literary scene than you might realize. From time to time, here on The Upload, we're gonna check in with some of the folks around town who wax poetic. This week, Gustavo Adolfo Ibar hits the diamond to tell us about baseball's traveling men in praise of the Latin and Negro Leagues. Justin Bond is the man behind the camera. Alavanza, praise the ball players with the call and response and scars on their bodies that said OJ. Black athletes with ties to the Negro Leagues, the sole option for play decades ago. Praise the talent in the Negro Leagues, men black as the bottom of the sea to a honey gold. Alabanza, praise the Kansas City Paseo YMCA, where Rube Foster and the others birthed the teams. Plucked dirt from the gutter, refined it to cleanliness. Alabanza, shall we praise Gus Greenlee, his numbers racket in Pittsburgh, for providing a place where only the ball was white so that every action meant a hurling, a casting out, a slamming away and dismantling the institution, sanctifying blackness. Praise the blackness, alabanza. Praise Quisqueya shine from across the Atlantic Ocean, like gold glimpsed through the eyes of ancient conquistadors. Praise the conquistadors, the island's tainos, its fruit, its soil. Alabanza. Praise the brutality of Rafael Leonidas Trujillo Molina, Chapitas, for taking Greenlee's ball club and putting it in Santo Domingo. Praise the breaking of contracts, luggage filled with cash, Satchel Page and Cool Papa, Josh Gibson and Sammy Bankhead, Cy Perkins and the others arriving on biplanes, landing on the Rio Iguamo right in front of the main church. Alabanza. Praise Trujillo's friends, enforcers of the national image and their leader's prestige, murdering civilians who opposed him, 
inserting politics into a sport developing its purity. Alabanza. Praise the scout and the Trujillo's orders who conspired to defraud the Crawfords of Satchel Page and got arrested twice during his pursuit. Alabanza. After the applause, wilder than applause, after Satchel and the team understood that anything bearing Trujillo's name will not lose, after unveiling the secrets of a thousand pitches, the trouble ball, the triple curve, the whipsy dipsy do, a swing, a miss, after military forces clobbered those against Ciudad Trujillo, after the near loss of three games to none and the winning of the pennant by Ciudad Trujillo. For a time, the Latin and Negro Leagues shined with the greatest players to ever play, like the Conquistadors' gold. Gold, I say, even if the fans cannot tell us about the gray in Trujillo's mustache, shaved at the edges, except the three to five centimeters above the center of the lip, because he had no lips. Gold, I say, to name the fastballs flung in revolutions across the mound of this stadium and stadiums to come. Alabanza, I say, even if Trujillo had no lips. Alabanza. When the leagues began from America, Latin America, Mexico, and the Caribbean basin, revolutions of fastballs rose and drifted towards each other, lightning crowned. And one said with a Spanish tongue, let me play, we have no field here. And the other said with an African tongue, I will let you play. Baseball is all we have. Microfinancing. Hardly sounds like a good topic for an art show, but I swear it really is. Bread KC is an organization formed a few years back to help artists make up for a drop in dollars from the government. They put together these pop-up events all over town, sometimes using local celebrity chefs, cooking dinners that both feed people and nourish creative ideas that sometimes need to find just a little more funding. And it's not always big bucks, but sometimes it's just enough to get good things cooking. Ashley Holcroft has been watching the Bread KC process. So here's what happens. On an evening much like this sweltering one in June, approximately 90 people, most of them strangers, buy a $15 to $25 ticket that entitles them to dinner and a vote on which of three pitch projects will win a microgrant. It's a concept that started in Chicago but quickly spread across the country and made its way to Kansas City via Sean Starowitz, Andy Erdich, and joined later by Aaron Olm Shipman. It's community building. And so what's happening is, if you're a presenter for five to seven minutes, you get 100 people listening to your idea. Regardless of whether they fund it or not, that's not what really Bread KC is actually about. It's literally about community building. And they've already microfunded a slew of projects that have enriched Kansas City. Projects that range from craft, to documentaries, to installations, to community workshops. And the list goes on. Try to be responsive to the community and that sense of like, where are the funding gaps happening? Is it performance art? Is it music? Is it curatorial practice? But what we found early on was that if you had three projects that were really different from each other at once, one would ultimately always win and it was really obvious which one would win because it was the project that involved children. We try to curate our dinners with like-minded presenters. And like this, this dinner is really about audience engagement. And here to try their hand at engaging that small but decisive audience are this quarter's contenders for the coveted prize. First up, it's private birthday party, which pretty much has it all. A treasure hunt, a couple of time capsules, and one big race against the clock. Private birthday party is a project that consists of uh, about 200 photographic slides of the drag culture in Kansas City from 58 to 68. Our first challenger's project began with an unlikely discovery made by creative partners Michael Bowles and Robert Heishman. We both found them about two years apart. Robert found his in 2006 in a scrapyard in the West Bottoms. And then two years later, a friend bought a house on Troost. And I went in the first week and found a shoebox filled with slides, went through them, realized kind of what it was, and then uh, called Robert shortly after. And then we realized that both of our collections matched up to even the same parties. 
Their goal is to preserve these treasures and find out all they can about the seemingly blank page in Kansas City history, and all before it's too late. Due to everybody being, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, time is of the essence. We need to piece all this together now. We can't wait on it. Everyone we've been in touch with that's either in the photos, uh, used to work at the clubs back then, or just was around, all are into what we're doing. They'll call us random times during the day and they'll give us a couple names if they remember or some phone numbers. And if they take home the prize? We're going to use the Bread KC money for making the best possible scans of what we have right now. And we also are going to use the money for travel expenses. We might do a road trip and visit a couple performers out in California that used to be a part of everything. So it's really just to get all the information and to document who's out there still. Our second candidate splits her time between classroom and studio and believes that confidence can be found at a toasty 6,330 degrees Fahrenheit. Angelica has a passion for sculptural welding. She's taught it at the college level for over two decades. And as an artist, she manages to harmonize steel with delicate porcelain to create something sublime. I want my work to convey an otherworldly environment, a sense of calmness and comfort. The creatures, they're basically between this attraction and repulsion. It's the drama inherent of something so alien yet so familiar. They're very visceral and the texture of the porcelain is almost like skin-like and the light within them, which I light them with LEDs, almost become life for them. Now Angelica wants to take her passion and considerable skills to the next generation of artists. My project is a traveling sculptural welding workshop and basically it's a mobile sculpture facility that I plan to take to local schools or art centers that have small or non-existing art programs. With the kids that attend the workshop, I hope to build their confidence in a way that they could feel that whatever passion that they seek out, that they could do it. Although, you know, welding is a technical skill, so if they choose to, they could use it in their career. Our final challenger found her calling by listening to that little voice inside. And that little voice said, Bagels! 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 After I graduated, I didn't have a lot of money because I was paying back student loans and stuff like that but I really wanted bagels, but they're obviously a lot more expensive than just a loaf of bread. So I decided to figure out how to make bagels, and once I learned how to do that, I thought to myself, well, I can make any bread, really, and after like many failed attempts at making bread, uh, friends started asking me to make them a loaf, and people who I didn't know wanted to buy it too. And then I got the opportunity to work in a commercial bakery, and I also taught a bagel making class. Now Rachel wants to share her passion and the how-tos of her ever-expanding repertoire. My project is an educational take on the business that I've been running for the past two years uh, through YouTube videos, small zines, and classes. And eventually that would lead up to a space that would be a bakery, a co-op kitchen, and a classroom where I could teach full price classes that would subsidize low income classes for people who could otherwise not afford it. I think that baking and like doing something that maybe you haven't done before and being able to succeed at it is really empowering and that's kind of what I'm doing to kind of bring people together around baking and around the kitchen table. Now these raconteurs have only five minutes to sell their venture to a discerning audience. Usually on the first day, students are intimidated by the flame, and by the end of that four-week course, that ends up being their favorite piece of equipment. We've contacted a guy that was 13 in 1964, and he remembers at five in the morning, a whole bunch of drag queens and party attendees getting arrested and fighting the police. One of the girls in my class asked me, is yeast a bug? And 
That made me realize that a lot of people don't know what is going into their food. There's this Midwestern politeness that's here, but they're also willing to be critical. And they, they have this like engagement and wonderment in one eye, and then they're also critical in the well, it's other. It's the show me state. It's the show me state, right? It sounds really trite and idealistic, but you really can make the things that you want to happen a reality. We've raised almost $18,000, and I just think that sooner or later people have to acknowledge that they are responsible for the community that they build for themselves. And that's what we did. And our winner for the 30th round is I Love You! This great old building in the crossroads used to be a beer warehouse owned by Tom Pettergast's son. And now the Mid-America Arts Alliance has their headquarters here. Yeah, they work under the motto, more art for more people. They cover a six state range and they've actually been kind of under the radar doing it for over 40 years. Along with touring acts and visual artists, one of the things they're starting to emphasize more and more is film and video. Ah, uh, that leads so conveniently into our next <laughs> story about Claymation and a Texas artist who was into cartoons all his life but sort of stumbled into a career in animation. Yeah! <laughs> kind of the barbarian. Thanks, Dad, right? Yeah, oh, sweet. Rockin'. <laughs> As a kid, I studied cartoons, of course, like every kid. My brothers and I, we would copy drawing cartoons. We would drive my mother crazy by speaking in cartoon voice all day long. Go ahead, rub my face in it. You know, I had this, like, background and knowing a lot about cartoons and things, so. <laughs> my wife was at a party at, in New York, and she was hanging out with some producers and things like that. And I had at home been making these little claymation cartoons. And she found out that one of the producer guys owned an animation studio and she told them that I was an animator. Which in the business means like you have an agent and you get like lots of money. When in reality I'd just been making these little cartoons. And he was like, great, we're shooting this thing. I need some more animators. Can you have them come down? And so I ran down to the studio to do the animation test and I was like, well, I don't really do this, but I'm a sculptor. <laughs> and so they stuck me in the a sculptor to sculpting department and that's how I got started. I've worked on commercials for Howard Johnson, for Grasso Soup, did something really cool for the Globetrotters, which was really great, and a television show on Nickelodeon. I worked on the pilot. I make animations. I also make the things in and around animation. So I'm really interested in this idea for gallery or fine art shows to have the feeling of an animation studio. So I usually show sets and characters and short spots of animation. And to me, it relates to the time that I spent working in an animation studio. Good afternoon. The worst is apparently over for the area around Brownsville as Hurricane Allen makes its way farther inland. The Hurricane Project started when I found this film footage of, a, of 1980 Hurricane Allen on YouTube. I took the audio from it and then reanimated the newscast. And part of the story talks about this tornado that hits a trailer home. And so I decided, well, I needed to build this trailer home. So the trailer home's in the tree, and then we have the animation, and so it builds kind of a whole story around that event. Eventually in the story, the family decides to continue to live in the trailer home after it's in the tree, and so they become this sort of redneck Swiss Family Robinson thing. <laughs> so anyway, it's just kind of my own little funny take on it. We ran into the bathroom, and then it sold just like that. I feel like art picked me. I've always made things, uh, my family, we all make things, and it's just that it's something I always do. So I can't really imagine not making things or making art. 
two can play this game. <laughs> and that's all the time we have this week. Hope you're getting the idea. We're here to prove that Kansas City is America's creative crossroads. Next week, we'll check into the amazing new Plains Indians exhibit at the Nelson Atkins Museum. Also, air guitar. Hey. Yeah, the championships, <laughs> no less. As we close, though, how about some real guitar playing from the Crossroads Music Festival a few weeks back? I'm Madison. And I'm Randy Mason. See you there. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation.